1 through 11. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Amen. Let's pray, please. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word. Thank you, Lord, for this message. And thank you for these people who are here today to receive it. I pray, Lord, that your strength, your power would be here, that we would see and hear what you have for us this day. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. The title is Repentance. Because Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of good, of knowledge of good and evil, every person uh, basically were born, we come with a basic knowledge of good and evil was built into us because they ate of the tree of fruit of knowledge and if it wasn't for that there would be very little that we could agree upon in society you know but because of that we can agree upon some things that's why any ethical or moral person would probably very heartedly concur with the judgment that God has pronounced on those immoral evil people who are described in Romans 1, 24 through 31. Now, if you remember, I told you to me that is some of the saddest parts of the Bible, the last part of Romans chapter 1, and, and even what we read today. To me, it's a very sad thing about humanity and, and mankind and where we are and what we've done. You see, these people here, they obviously deserve judgment for their gross, uh, fra- uh, flagrant sins into which they have, they've really driven themselves into which they're attempting to pull society. They, they have sinned so much and believe in their sins so much that they're trying to pull society to be like them, to pull the society that way. And Now, that's easy for us to point at them and say they're wrong. But what about other people whose lives don't bear the evidence that God has turned them over to their sin or the corruption in their lives? Remember, one of the saddest things, and God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. What about the ones whose sins are not as obvious? How does God look at the, let's say, the more upright, the more moral, maybe the religious person who has a sense of right and wrong and maybe even leads an outwardly virtuous life. We all know that we're all sinners and they are sinners too. And those who are very obvious about it, they're sinners and we're sinners. Does God consider those who are righteous, who can distinguish between right and wrong and who live decent lives by worldly standards how does God consider those does he consider them righteous are they okay obviously the answer is no 
And the reason it's no is because until a person recognizes that they stand guilty and con condemned before God, that they are sinners who do not meet the standards of righteousness, the, of God's righteousness, there is no possibility of salvation. We must come to realize that we are sinners and we do not stand up to God's standards. We may stand up to the standards of the world, we may be good people when you compare us to the worldly standards, but what about God's standards? That's how we're judged, not by the worldly standards. Only repentance, only repentance that causes one to, to try to stop sinning, to severe ourselves, to, to cut ourselves off from sin, and try to live a daily obedient life. Only that can lead to true salvation. So, let's look at our scripture here. Judge self as you do others. Paul continues his search for the God kind of righteousness with a general statement, which is this statement is applicable to everyone in verse 1, but especially to the morally upright who keep a sharp eye out for the faults of other people. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He says, you therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now what gets me is it says you, and then it says therefore. And therefore refers to what Paul has just written in the last half of chapter 1. And the you means anyone and everyone who's reading or hearing these words. So here again, he points out that all mankind stands before God without excuse. You are without excuse if you practice any of the sexual or social sins described in chapter 1. Now those who don't recognize their particular condition or inclination only prove that their mind or thinking has sort of become depraved. And let me explain. If you, I think those are the ones who don't even realize they're sinning. They've gone so far that God has turned them over to their sin. But if you recognize these as sins, as evil, and you condemn yourself because to varying degrees, we all practice many of these same sins. Maybe we don't do it to the same degree. Maybe we don't do it exactly the same, but we're all sinners, and in many ways, we commit the same sins that we tell other people that they're doing. It's easier to see sin in someone else's life than it is to see the sin in our life. The word judge is to pick out or separate or produce judgment or condemn. The word condemn means to judge down. We need to speak out against sin, but we must do it with a spirit of humility, realizing that many times we are guilty too. Often the sins we notice most clearly in others are the very ones that we commit ourselves. If we look closely at ourselves, we might find that we are committing the same sins, but it's more sociably acceptable. Many times we're committing the same sins that these people that we say are depraved, but we do it to where it's more acceptable, you know, to the world. For example, who person who gossips may be critical of other people who are gossiping about them, right? Even though they gossip. You see, the understanding of divine standards and human shortcomings is emphasized here in verse 2. It says, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Very important part. It's based on truth. You may judge yourself with favoritism, but we know that God does not judge us with favoritism. It's based on truth. The judgment of God 
rightly or literally is according to truth and be without error and without partiality. When God's judgment is ex executed on those who indulge themselves in sin, it is based on the truth. So, his judgment's not founded upon mere appearances or pretenses or professions. It's, it's on the truth of the case. And we can't expect God to judge us any other way or any other standard except by the truth. Verse 3 reads the thoughts of man. It says, so when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? It's a question. The truth that God's judgment is just and will fall upon all who practice evil is so plain that it's really a folly to deny it. Only those who have sought uh, acquittal and forgiveness from God by repentance will escape. Only those who ask for it. Only those who search for it. When someone we know is caught up in some terrible crime or sin, we may, we may show one of these three attributes. First, we can be indifferent, saying it's none of our business, and the victim can solve his own problems the best way he can. Or second, we can show love and compassion and reminding ourselves, there go I except by the grace of God. Third, we can act shocked, showing a holier-than-thou judgmental attitude toward the one who's caught in sin. It is possible to lift ourselves in God's sight by boasting how much better we are than someone else? Is it? Is it possible to lift ourselves up? Good sinners. Good sinners. If there's such a thing, we need God's mercy and grace and forgiveness as much as the bad sinners. Who squander life in perversion. We need God's grace and mercy just as much as everybody else. Churches are to sort of be like, well, let's compare churches. They're sort of like a lifeboat. Here we are. We're in this lifeboat, and we're trying to help people who are out there struggling to get in the lifeboat, right? Churches are not like cruise liners, luxury cruisers where we're sitting back enjoying our salvation. And, oh, those poor people out there in the water, let them go. That's not the way churches are. We're a lifeboat trying to pull other people into the boat with us. So we need to make sure that all those drowning people, we at least offer a hand to help them into the boat. And it leads to repentance. The grounds on which the false expectation to escape judgment without acquittal or forgiveness is based on verse 4. It says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, his forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Many of us think because we're not presently under God's judgment and wrath that maybe we don't deserve to be punished. Maybe we've escaped it. Maybe we're going to get away with it. You know, as a kid, I can remember if mom and dad didn't punish me and they forgot. Ooh, maybe they forgot. Maybe I'm going to make it. That's not the way it is with God. You know, if we think that since we're not presently experiencing judgment that we do not deserve to be judged or that maybe God doesn't care or our sinfulness, uh, then we, we sort of look down on the, the patience and the love of God if we think that way 
kindness and forbearance and patience expresses the divine order under different aspects. Kindness is goodness that slows, shows gentleness, showing favors, act of kindness in general. Forbearance is a, a truce, a, a temporary cessation of hostility until negotiations succeed or fail. Patience is slowness in avenging wrongs. Now, the fact that you are not being punished does not mean that God does not exist or cannot punish or does not punish sin. The fact that his punishment does not immediately follow sin is not proof of his not having any power. What it is, is proof of his patience. We deserve punishment all the time for our sins, don't we? But God doesn't punish us immediately, does he? Well, that shows that God is patient with us. We owe our lives, our very lives, to the kindness of God. I've often said, if I was God for a day, we'd all be dead. Because I'd be punishing us left and right, wouldn't you? But God has the patience of God. The kindness of God is designed to bring us to repentance. If it does not, it's our fault. If he is patient with us and doesn't punish us and we don't repent, it's not God's fault. He is patient. It's our fault. We are responsible to know that God's kindness leads to repentance. The kindness of God should make us willing to repent, but it does not force us to repent. Did you notice that? Think about that. Because God is so kind and loving and patient, he doesn't force us to repent. He's not got a whip up saying, I'm going to punish you. No, he says, you're sinning. Don't do it. We know he will. Punished. So what we should think is, I need to repent of my sins. He withholds our due punishment so we might recognize his kindness and have hope and forgiveness and turn away from our evil ways. Notice that repentance or the change of mind that causes one to change your life is a product of realizing that God who should be judging us, is not presently judging, but he's being kind and asking us to come to him so he might change us. Now that's a loving God. Verse 5 attempts to startle the hard-hearted out of their self-deception. It says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Mm. Because people don't get immediate judgment from God, some don't slow down in their sinning in spite of the fact that they know it's wrong. Even though God's telling them they're wrong, they know it's wrong. Because God isn't punishing them, then they keep on sinning. Thus the judgment they deserve for their deeds is growing and growing and it will be delivered upon them as part of their eternal judgment. The word storing up means laying up little by little. Little by little they're storing up their rewards or the wrath of God. You see the mercy and the love of God are not meant to make us feel that we can sin and get away with it. The mercy and love of God is meant to break our hearts so that we will seek not to sin. When we realize that God is such a merciful and loving God, we should be ashamed of ourselves, our sin, and make us repent and turn to God. If the goodness of God does not lead us to repentance, then usually you know what happens? 
our hearts become hardened. The Bible always looks to the judgment as certain, although it's not always immediate. We know that God will judge. When, we don't know. But we must repent. And so we have judged by actions. Verse 6 again emphasizes that God's judgment is based on actions. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Now verse 6 is a quote from Proverbs 24, 12. In the final analysis, man will be judged uh, justly according to the facts by one who knows them all. And it is by these facts that we are accepted or rejected. God will judge men neither according to their professions nor by their relations, but according to their deeds. Now, I want you to understand something. The apostle here is not teaching the method of justification, but a principle of justice where all men will be judged. This is not salvation by works. Everybody understands that. Salvation is by grace alone. But man is responsible for responding to God's grace with faith and in faith we work. Because faith without works is no faith at all. It's dead. The principle laid down in verse 6 is amplified in verses 7 and 8, where 2, all inclusive classes are given. The first group listed in verse 7 is those who persist in doing good. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Now, the point toward which the argument is moving is the impartiality of the judge and his judgments. He's not talking about salvation by works, for there's no such thing as salvation by works. Neither is there such a thing as salvation that does not work either. A faith which does not issue forth in righteous deeds is not a biblical faith. The only way you can see a man's faith is how? By his deeds. By his works. I've seen men, uh, let me take that back. I've heard men talk a great faith. They can talk a great faith, but they can't do nothing with their faith. Makes me wonder, do they really have a faith or do they have a fancy tongue? There's many men who have fancy good tongues that can talk, ooh, I'm impressed. But their works are not there. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. Faith is never separated from deeds. They are bound together. Faith and deeds go together. If one has faith, then that person has deeds also, good deeds. The highest and most wonderful desire of a believer is to give glory to God. If you're a believer, you should have a deep-rooted desire to give God glory. The person who does not want to do that or does not have a deep desire to give God glory, I'm not sure they're true believers. In fact, I'll go so far as to say, if they don't want to glorify God, they're not believers. I don't know how to say it any better than that and any plainer than that. You either want to glorify God and serve him, in one way, shape, or form, or I'm cons I don't think you're saved. To live for the glory of God is just like Jesus. It's Christ's likeness, or to manifest the very nature of God. As you give yourself into God's hands, you become the handiwork of God. And I think there could be no greater reward than to be like God makes me. 
The second group here given in verse 8 are those who follow their own stubborn hearts. It says, but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Here we find the reason people do not obey the truth. It is because they are selfishly ambitious. When a person does not obey the truth, automatically they obey unrighteousness. They can't be on the fence. You're either for God or against God. You either follow God or follow Satan. There's no in between. For the disobedient, there will be wrath and there will be anger. And they will be object of the wrath and anger of God on the day of the final judgment and forever thereafter. God's wrath reaches fever pitch when his mercy and his grace is over. Wow, can you imagine when he has no more mercy for us and no more grace for us? That's going to be a terrible time because without it, we are lost. An obedient Christian does not live according to his own will or for his own pleasure. He lives according to the will of Christ and for the glory of Christ. A Christian seeks to submit himself or herself to Jesus and let him rule his heart, his conscience, and his life. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying a Christian is perfect. We're not perfect. But we have a desire to follow God. And where we can, which is most of the time, we put him first. Now, I know that there are times... We can't. But most of the time, we can put God first. We choose not to. And you don't have to answer to Pastor Lockwood, but according to God's word and what I'm reading right here, you're going to answer to God. Pretty plain, pretty simple. Don't blame me, I told you so. When you stand before God, don't you dare say, Pastor Lockwood didn't tell me that because I'm telling you now. You will stand before God. He will judge you. And I hope he accepts these your excuses, but I don't think he will because he's already said you are without excuse. Then in verses 9 and 10 of our scripture, we have a summary of the two categories of people. First in verse 9, those who live for self. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For the disobedient, there will be outward affliction and inward distress. Judgment shall begin with the Jews, and then it will be extended to the Gentiles. The Jews are first in privilege, which means also they're first in responsibility. The second group are those who live for God and his greater glory in verse 10. It says, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The judgment to the disobedient threatens death, meaning eternal separation from God's goodness and glory and blessing. Now, God's promises a uh, life to the obedient here. And this is a life of eternal glory, eternal honor, and eternal peace. And God will make certain that the glory and honor that is sought by every man who does good, does good will indeed be his reward. Hallelujah. So all judged impartially. The main point is the same standard of judgment will be for everyone, as verse 11 states. It says, for God does not show favoritism. When we stand before God, he will not show any favoritism for anybody. The idea is to give consideration to a person because of who he is. That exact idea is seen in the popular symbolic statue of justice of a woman. You've seen this statue of a woman of justice holding the scales. Guess what? She's blindfolded. Why is she blindfolded? She's blindfolded so she can't see who it is. All she knows is the evidence that she hears. God will not favor me. 
just because I'm a pastor and a preacher. He will show me no favor. I know that. In fact, I think I'm called to a higher responsibility because in many ways I am blessed more than you are. I really believe that. And I believe that I will be held to a higher standard. Not, it's just because we are looked at impartially. I, as anyone else, will be judged according to my deeds. God will look at what I have done and what I have not done. And he will judge me according to that. Any doctrine which tends to produce security in sin is false. There is no security in sin. God's judgment is sure. We just don't know when. So in conclusion, perseverance in God's will is the hallmark of a genuine believer. Without excuse. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Without excuse. Those who seek God's honor persist in doing good deeds. Without excuse. Their reward will not necessarily be here today or tomorrow. But it may be in, and it will be in, etern in eternity if it hasn't happened already. Likewise, judgment is usually reserved for eternity. Not today. And you may say, why? Why does God wait for his judgment and his wrath? Because in his kindness... God holds back his judgment, giving people time to repent. It's easy to mistake God's patience for approval of the wrong way that we are living. As Christians, though, we must pray constantly and continually that God will point out our sins so that he can heal them. I want to know when I sin. I want to feel conviction so that I can repent. And you should feel the same way. If you don't, then guess what you've already done? You've already hardened your heart. If you don't want God pointing out your sins, if you don't want to hear it, you've already hardened your heart. And many places in God's word it says, do not harden your hearts. As your forefathers did. Don't harden your hearts. Look, I'll be the first one to admit that conviction from God hurts. I don't like it. But I'm so glad that God still loves me and he's doing it for my good. Although God does not usually punish us immediately for our sins, his eventual judgment is certain. Someday he will. We don't know exactly when it will happen, but we know that no one will escape that final encounter with the Creator. Judgment Day is coming, brothers and sisters. I don't know when it's going to be. And anybody who tells you they know, run away from them. Because they don't know. But I know it's coming. I just don't know when. Nobody does. Even Jesus said he didn't know the day. Let us pray.